the frosty northlands of prehistoric Canada, 76 million years ago. Though the continent is further north than it is today, it is considerably warmer, especially in summer. But at this time in history, summer involves 120 days of sunlight, so animals are making the most of fresh growth, and the battle between predator and prey is seen in constant light. Down by the river, a hadrosaur, Prosaurolophus, has been brought down by a Dusbledosaurus. The 8-meter, 3-ton herbivore provided more than enough meat for the large Tyrannosaur, and so she has moved on, leaving the carcass for the scavengers. In the past day, numerous scavengers have moved in to feed on the bounty that has been left for them, from tiny mammals to small dromaeosaurs. At present though, they have all had to make way for some of the largest scavengers that have flown in on vast wings. The decaying body is currently swarmed by eight juvenile cryodracon. The Esdarkid pterosaurs are the largest flying animals this far north, though almost all of their food comes from the land. They will eat just about anything, from small dinosaurs to fish, and, if they can catch them, other pterosaurs. This banquet of meat is an easy meal for the young cryodracon, though it's not what their beaks are evolved to process. There is simply so much flesh left over from the Dasplitosaurus that they only need to bite and pull in order to strip off a morsel big enough for them to swallow. None of the individuals here are fully grown, but with wingspans between 4 and 5 meters, they stand tall enough to look a man dead in the eye. As the pterosaurs move over the carcass and occasionally jab each other with their beaks, a pair of Sauronophilestes are keeping their distance waiting for the flyers to eat their fill. These are a common sight amongst the fallen bodies of massive dinosaurs, feeding on the leftovers of predators hundreds of times their weight. The cryodracon are taking their time, gorging themselves with little care, and ignoring the swarms of insects that are also feeding on the carcass. In fact, it takes them a while to notice that they have a visitor. Marching up the river following the scent of decay, is a juvenile Gorgosaurus. These theropods can reach 9 meters long, however this female is only 4 meters. Gorgosaurus, like other Tyrannosaurs, go through a massive stage of growth in their teenage years, but she is yet to have reached that stage of her life, and still has the lean, speedy build of an adolescent. Normally they travel in groups, but she is broken away from her pack, the smell of fresh meat, too much of a lure. Approaching the carcass, she can see the eight cryodracons squabbling amongst themselves, and yet none of them have noticed her approach. And so she lets them know she is coming. She breathes in, and lets out a menacing snarl that carries up the river, and all eyes, be they dinosaur or pterosaur, turn to look at her. The cryodracon frees briefly, judging whether or not she is a threat. The gorgosaurus snarls again as she approaches, lifting her head up higher to seem larger. Three of the cryodracon take to the wing, flying away from any confrontation. The rest begin screeching and barking at her, trying to intimidate her back. The Gorgosaurus continues her steady walk and gets closer to the pterosaurs, so she begins growling lowly. Two more of the cryodracon back up, but one takes two steps forward and stands directly between her and the hadrosaur body. He then rears up onto his back legs and spreads his wings out to make himself look as large as possible, all the while barking at the Tyrannosaur with the rest of his kind. The Gorgosaurus shrinks slightly, but draws on her courage and snarls again. The Cryodracon she is facing does something similar to what modern vultures do when under threat. It opens its mouth and projectile vomits. The female is right in front of the Asdarkid, and has no time to react. The mixture of half-digested flesh and bile splatters across the left side of her head and down her neck. The concoction stung her eye, and she reeled back in shock, hissing and flailing, trying to shake the vomit off of herself. She had just enough composure to turn around and run away from the still screeching cryodracon that could have attacked her at any moment. The large pterosaurs watched the female tyrannosaur run away, 
and eventually calm down. She may be in pain, but the injury wouldn't be permanent. The pterosaurs soon returned to feeding, though one of them was far more hungry than the rest. The Sauronophilestes ignore the large meal, and go to the spot where the mass of vomit is on the ground. Meat is meat, after all. Hello fellow travellers and welcome back. Today we will be breaking down the Dragon of the North, Cryodracon. Cryodracon's first remains were discovered in 1972, in Alberta, Canada as part of the Dinosaur Park formation. Since then, multiple fossils of this species have been discovered. However, these remains were originally attributed to another genus, the more famous Quetzalcoatlus. It wasn't until 2019 that a proper analysis of the bones were done, and it was discovered that these fossils belong to a unique genus, and so was given the name Cryodracon boreus. The genus name meaning cold or ice dragon, and the species name meaning belonging to the north wind. So, Ice Dragon of the North Wind. Cryodracon was a pterosaur in the Asdarkid family that lived in the northern parts of North America in the late Cretaceous between 76 and 74 million years ago. A few individuals have been discovered, though with limited remains. Interestingly, almost all of them were immature when they died. Altogether, the known remains of Cryodracon include wing bones, neck vertebra, hind limbs, parts of the pectoral girdle, and a rib, which doesn't sound like a lot, but for an Asdarkid, that's a gold mine. The smallest individual was a juvenile known from a neck vertebra 10 millimeters long, and so may have had a wingspan of 2 meters. The holotype was estimated to have a 5 meter wingspan when it died, and for a while this was thought to be the biggest specimen. But then they reassigned a neck vertebra that was 50 centimeters in length meaning that this individual could have had a wingspan 10 meters across. That puts Cryodracon close to some of the largest Asdarkids, including Quetzalcoatlus and Aramborgiania. Currently being in the top 5 largest flying animals ever to have existed. It may not quite have reached the size of its southern cousin, but its thicker, more sturdier bones may mean it was similar in weight, or even heavier. So how did Cryodracon fit into its environment? Well, despite North America being further north at the time, the climate would have been considerably warmer, being described as having both alluvial and coastal plains, with warm temperatures and high precipitation. Many species from various dinosaur families have been found in the Dinosaur Park formation, including Lambiosaurs, Chasmosaurs, Centrosaurs, Nodosaurs, and Chylosaurs, Pachycephalosaurs, Oviraptors, Tyrannosaurs, Dromaeosaurs, and Troodontids. Speaking of which, one of the fossils of Cryodracon had the tooth of a Dromaeosaur stuck in the bone. The culprit was likely a Sauronophilestes that scavenged on the dead pterosaur and shows that the thin walled bone was too tough for the small carnivore to get through. Cryodracon itself was likely a top order carnivore. As said in previous episodes, as darkids in general are thought to have behaved similar to modern ground storks, except that some of them were the size of giraffes. Spending most of their time on land, they would stalk the landscape, snatching up any animal that was small enough for them to swallow whole. Though we don't have the skull of Cryodracon, and that is very important in knowing what its diet was. It's usually depicted as having the long narrow beak of Quetzalcoatlus, which is a fair assumption. But not all members of this family had such beaks, including Well Hobotornis from Texas, which had shorter, thicker jaws which may have been better suited for feeding on carrion. It's difficult to say with accuracy how these giants lived, but it's likely that since they were so large they went after multiple food sources. Perhaps they would fly down into herds of hadrosaurs, scaring them with their size and in the commotion grabbing the young from between the adults. They also at times may have acted more like wading storks, moving through shallow creeks or rivers and suddenly stabbing their beaks into the water, pulling out a fish or a small marine reptile. That's half the fun of these lesser known species. You can speculate a little more freely. Have fun with it as it were. 
such as the proposed idea that these huge beasts could reach speeds of between 80 and 100 kilometers while flying, which would have given them incredible ranges. Unfortunately, we have so few remains of Asdarkids in general, as they only grew to their large sizes towards the end of the Cretaceous, as well as since they are pterosaurs, their bones are so thin and lightweight, they don't fossilize as easy as other animals. But their remains have been found in North and South America, in Russia, China, and all across Europe. They were everywhere, so clearly they were quite successful, and no doubt influenced ecosystems wherever they spread to. If you ever want to debate what the closest thing to a real dragon is, these should be top of your list. But what do you think of Cryodracon? And for my question of the week, which of the two skull examples I provided do you think Cryodracon had? What less unknown pterosaur would you like me to do a breakdown on next? And until then, please like, share, subscribe, and thank you for watching.